run is marked by a sign that reads simply the ancient world. Vast amount of archaeological and literary remains of the ancient world has to do with matters of society and business and politics. But a surprising amount of it has to do with religion and what is time Everywhere in the ancient world we hear talk about God, spirit. Everywhere there are myths. Everywhere people engage in ritual ceremonial practices that act out. There can be little doubt that the ancients were heirs to a religious tradition in which they and their ancestors told of encounters between gods and mortals. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, for example, we have a document at least 1,500 years older than Homer. Preserved on clay tablets, it is the still moving account of a man's encounter with the death of his friend. When Enkidu died, his brother and other self, as the text calls him, Gilgamesh, makes a long journey to his relative Utnapishtim, the faraway, to whom the gods are said to have given the gift of immortality. The journey fails. It's not a success. After many hardships, Gilgamesh finds his relative Utnapishtim, and he gives him, a, uh, the relative gives him a plant that has the secret of the restoration of lost youth. But when Gilgamesh sleeps, the plant is stolen by the serpent, uh, who immediately sloughs off his own skin and revives his own youth. The ancient Babylonian myth is thus pessimistic about the human quest for a spirit that would lead to immortality. Immortality was a boon the Babylonian gods kept to themselves. Ancient Egyptian religion, on the other hand, was optimistic about an afterlife. Uh, the uh, divine figure Osiris confers this uh, great boon on her followers. What is most striking about these two ancient mythic worlds is not their opposing conclusions, one optimistic and one pessimistic. What's most striking is the presence in nature of the gods. Nature is everywhere present in the pessimistic Gilgamesh epic. Here already one finds the sacred mountain, dwelling place of the gods, the text calls it. Shamash is the glorious sun god. Adad is the storm god. Anu the god of the firmament, Ishtar, goddess of love, Enil, god of the mountains. Shamash appears as a wild, sacred bull, a holy animal. Even the plant world is filled with awesome power and presence. When Gilgamesh and his friend Enkidu go to do battle with the monster Humbaba, they go to the cedar forest, a place where the presence of divinity can be felt and feared. And, of course, the plant lost by Gilgamesh to the serpent, dying and rising every year as it does, contains an immortal spirit, a secret that human beings would very much like to know. The meeting of a mortal with a god is called a theophany. It is clear in both the Gilgamesh epic and the story of Osiris that theophanies are nature theophanies. Encounters with gods are encounters with nature. Religious experience is everywhere an element of life for people in the ancient world who live close to nature. Religion in the ancient world does not arise out of some alien source and impose itself on an otherwise secular life experience. Religion is part of nature. If one turns to the Hebrew scriptures, one finds Moses meeting God in a burning bush. And then there is the dramatic theophany of the Lord God on Mount Sinai at the time the Ten Commandments were promulgated. 
On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning, as well as a thick cloud on the mountain, and a blast of a trumpet so loud the people in the camp trembled. Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke, because the Lord had descended upon it in fire, while the whole mountain shook violently. Even the God of the Bible, whose theophanies are frequently described as historical events, even that God is a storm God, a volcano God. Readers of Hesiod and Homer, even readers of Ovid, can easily make a catalog of the gods by the nature element they are associated with. Zeus is a sky god, Poseidon, god of the sea, Hades, god of death in the underworld, Apollo, god of the sun, Aphrodite, goddess of love, Demeter, earth goddess. These and other members of the Greek pantheon are not, I think, personifications of nature, though it's often said that they are. They are the results of religious experiences in the presence of the sky, the sun, the moon, the earth, the forests. Mortals come into contact with an awesome reality a sacred presence. Here it was felt was the holy, the source of life and meaning. And this, the ancients said, we must hold on to or we will be lost. Homer makes one society out of both gods and mortals who populate his grand epic. Both gods and mortals do battle in the Iliad. In the Odyssey, gods and mortals conspire to bring Odysseus home and to hinder his return to Ithaca. When he arrives home after 20 years absence, 10 years fighting, 10 years wandering, he comes disguised as a poor beggar. He reveals himself to his wife, faithful Penelope, but uh, after 20 years she puts him to a test. And she doesn't directly ask that he prove that he is Odysseus. Rather, she orders her maid, Eurycleia, uh, to make up a bed for the stranger. Bring Odysseus' own bed from his bedroom out here and cover it with fleeces and blankets, she tells Eurycleia. Odysseus responds to Penelope, proved that he was her long-absent husband. No one could have moved that bed, that bed I made. For I laid the bedroom out around a live olive tree, trimmed it and planed it and made it a bedpost with its roots in the ground. No one, unless he dug up that post, could have moved my bed. But this Penelope and Odysseus burst into tears and embraced at long last. Man like Odysseus, rooted in his native soil, whose marriage was rooted in his native soil, would have found it hard to worship Homer's gods. They are the gods whose power and divinity were everywhere around him, in the land, in the sky, in the sun, in the trees, especially in the sacred olive, sacred to Athena. The Greeks not only preserved ancient nature theophanies in the great Homeric myth, but they acted them out in their ancient rituals on stage. The plays of Aeschylus and Sophocles dramatized the mythic encounters with gods so that the people in the audience could have the same encounter with the deity that the hero or heroine had in the myth. So far from being meaningless, perfunctory gestures, Rituals are representations of religious experience, and when they're done as well as the Greeks did them in their theaters, they are a compelling element of authentic religious life. In almost every modern city in the Mediterranean you visit, you can go to the old quarter and see the stone amphitheater. It's rather well preserved, actually. And uh, if you could turn back time, um, when the theater was full and the audience had just seen Aeschylus or Astia, one would have a sense, I think, that the gods had indeed been present on the stage. Well, 
Let's turn on our skis now and drop quickly to where the arrow points and the sign says the medieval world. Here the slope is gentle and will go a bit slower. The medieval world is Christian, specifically Catholic, though in many ways it's as different from our times as the ancient world is. It'll be good to have a guide, and the guide I have invited is Henry Adams, the great-grandson of John Adams and the grandson of John Quincy Adams. But Henry is not a politician like his grandfathers. Henry is a scholar, a medievalist, and his book on the cathedrals is the best ever written by an American. Um, we must remember, as we listen to Henry Adams, that like the Greek theaters, cathedrals are places for ritual performance. Only the cathedrals are vastly more complicated structures than the ancient amphitheaters ever were. Ever were. That is the reason for the guide. This worked very well about 10 minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, I, think, I think I am. You want to come and do this? I'm Henry Adams, and yes, I have served as a guide to cathedrals built in the Middle Ages, but I have only guided nieces, though on occasion, if a niece isn't available, a niece in wish will do. I have only one rule for my niece, and that is that she must bring a Kodak. Let me show you an album of her photographs from last summer. We sailed in early June to Cherbourg and took the train across Normandy to Mont Saint-Michel. We drove along the chaussée, over the sand, Well, is it on? Over the sand and through the tide and came inside the gate to Madame Pouillard's famous hotel. While my niece photographed, I talked. The archangel loved heights. He stands on the summit of the tower that crowns his church, wings upspread, sword uplifted, the devil crawling beneath. The archangel stands for church and state and both militant. His place was where the danger was the greatest. And so you find him here, where he has stood for centuries on his mount in peril of the sea. Our Norman ancestors were at work building this abbey in the 11th century before they left to conquer England in 1066. We Normans quarried the stone for St. Michael and fought the English with the same energy. Here in the crypt of massive pillars and tiny chapels, the great church began to take shape. Here the lines are Norman 
round, Romanesque, and strong, perhaps not graceful, but masculine, and suggestive of the archangel who stands on the tower high above. Here in the church above the crypt, the same lines and rounded arches mark the Norman architecture. On four great piers at the intersection of the nave and the transept, the whole weight of the central tower is supported. Here is your first 11th century church. How do you like it? Here we feel not the Trinity at all, the Virgin, but little Christ hardly more. We feel only the archangel and the unity of God. Church and state, body and soul, God and man are all one at Mont Saint-Michel. Let's look about. The choir, the altar, Bishop Aubert, who received the instructions from Michael to build a church here. But the church is not the only thing that the tourists should see on this mount in peril of the sea. Mont Saint-Michel was a Benedictine monastery. Here, in this hall, the monks welcomed the knights of the Order of St. Michael. The whole design is as beautiful a bit of early Gothic as exists. Hospitality was a monastic rule and it was fulfilled in this beautiful room. Next door, however, exists an even more graceful hall, the refectory where the monks ate. Here hardly a trace of the Romanesque remains. Everything is lightened. Graceful windows fill the room with light. Gothic builders were greedy for light. We'll see later what they did with color. But you must see another room important in every abbey. It is the library. Here monks copied manuscripts, read, uh, illuminated missals. The little room is a gem, a quiet corner in the monastery in which to contemplate the goodness of God. Only one other spot in the monastery might have been more favored place for meditation, the cloister. It is the most charming of all in the summer. Here we see the mastery of love, of thought, of poetry, over the masculine military energy of the great hall below. The tourist must climb down and look at these sights from below. This wall is called the Wonder. The buttresses measure more than a hundred feet. The sum of this impossible wall and its exaggerated vertical lines is strength and intelligence at rest. The whole of the mount still kept the grand style. It expressed the unity of church and state, God and man, war and peace, life and death, good and bad. It solved the problem of the universe. Priest and soldier were both at home here. The politician was not outside of it. The sinner was welcome. The poet was happy. God reconciles all. The world is an evident, obvious, sacred harmony. From Mont Saint-Michel, the architectural road leads across Normandy, up the Seine to Paris, and at last to Chartres. Coutances comes first after Mont Saint-Michel. The cathedral at Coutances is said to be the age of the wonder, and the work is so Norman as to stand by itself. Nowhere in France will you find a central tower to compare to the enormous pile at Coutances. As we see it today, the spire is missing. Supply the spire in your mind, and the meaning of the tower cannot be mistaken. It is military. It is the man at arms himself, mounted and ready for battle, the spear at rest. Nothing could be more Norman, but the, such militant churches could force heaven itself. And yet Normans were a complex people, and that complexity shows inside 
no other cathedral in France or Europe has an interior more refined, more tender. Inside, Coutances is built for the Virgin. It is filled with a delicate and feminine charm. That charm is seen everywhere, here in the nave, in the choir, in the Lady Chapel, located directly behind the high altar as a private room for the Virgin. Here in Normandy, to the astonishment of historians, there suddenly appeared a passionate outbreak of religious devotion to the ideal of feminine grace and beauty and love. Among the most hard-hearted and hard-headed people in Europe, the church is a monument to that ideal. From Coutances, we pass on to the city of Bayeux. At Bayeux is a great cathedral with two superb western towers crowned by their spires. The spire is the simplest part of church architecture and needs the least study in order to be felt. The spire typified the aspirations of people when their aspirations were at the highest. Many French churches lack the spires intended for them. But here at Bayeux, they stand and witness that what our Norman ancestors began, they finished. Coutances and Bayeux are interesting, but the city of Caen is a Romanesque mecca. Here William the Conqueror and Queen Matilda built Norman churches with Norman exteriors and Norman interiors. Someday, if you like, uh, we could take this Romanesque style south, even into Italy, where it was born. But now we must go on to Rouen, where the Norman style begins to give way to that of the Ile de France. At Rouen, we see a cathedral in which both Norman and French influences are to be found, but the French predominate. The Normans and the French never spoke the same architectural language. Uh, the Normans built towers in which all the stories were of equal height. The Norman scheme was to state the facts and then stop. Uh, the French scheme is more graceful. It states the beauties and more or less fits the facts to them. And here we take leave of Normandy. Now we are at Mantes where the Cathedral of Notre Dame de Mont is a sister church to the Church of Our Lady in Paris and to our destination, Our Lady of Chartres. The church at Mont is as it was when it was built in the year 1200, a very pure early Gothic structure. What the tourist must notice here is the rose window, 27 feet across, this rose of Mont is the first Gothic rose of great dimensions. Some say it's the best of them. Here the rose motif is carried out through the entire system of window construction. The rose window is one of the loveliest features of Gothic architecture, and we shall see it again at Chartres. We've set out to go from Mont Saint-Michel to Chartres in three centuries, the 11th, the 12th, and the 13th, trying to get on the way not technical knowledge or accurate information about art or history or religion, but only a sense of what those centuries had to say and a sympathy for their ways of saying it. Let us go straight to Chartres. The first glimpse that is caught, and that was meant to be caught, is that of the two spires. No person, uh, well, nine persons out of ten, perhaps, or 99 out of 100, who come within sight of the two spires of Chartres Cathedral will think it a jest if they are told that the smaller one of the two, the simpler, the one that impresses them least, is the one they are expected to recognize as the most perfect piece of architecture in the world. And nearly 350 feet high, it is built up with an amount of intelligence and refinement that leaves tourists uh, with no chance to think of a criticism. Somehow, the architect 
succeeds in carrying our eyes from the four-sided base to the eight-sided spire with a degree of finesse that is unsurpassed. And towers, though beautiful, are the least religious architecture and uh, not really essential to the church. Bernard of Clairvaux, St. Bernard, thought them a growth due to worldliness, just an ornament. The church door is another matter. It symbolizes the way to eternal life. The portal of Chartres is the most complete and instructive of Gothic doors. Over the central door is Christ, who offers himself to his flock as the herald of salvation. There's no hint of fear, punishment, or damnation. Before 1300, the church seems not to have felt it necessary to appeal habitually to terror. The promise of hope and happiness was enough. At Chartres, Christ was identified with his mother, the spirit of love and grace. And his church is the church triumphant. A turn aside and look at the south door. It belongs to the Virgin and reminds us that we are to enter the court of the Queen of Heaven. The Empress receives all who come. Not one of these long figures which line her doorway, is anyone but an off officer in attendance on the empress and her son and bears the stamp of the imperial court. These officers of the virgins are themselves, virgin are themselves kings and queens, prophets, apostles, saints. Only later tourists saw these figures as stiff. Mary's pilgrims saw them filled with the same feminine grace that marks the whole building. But we shall not enter the church here. We must go round to the north side and see the porch dedicated to the Virgin. The French loved porches more than any other people and took great care of them. Women especially came here when they needed help. It was the only place where they were sure to find a reception. The main feature of the central bay over the door is a scene of the coronation of Mary as Queen of Heaven. It dominates the whole idea of the church. Here, Mary, seated by divine right on the throne of heaven, is one with her son. Unless we feel this assertion, Chart is unintelligible. Of course, the assertion is not orthodox, but even the Bishop of Chartres would not raise an objection. He's much more afraid of Mary than he ever was of a church council. Like pilgrims, like all the pilgrims, the bishop too noticed what was missing among the 700 figures about Mary's porch, the judgment. Nothing here suggests such a thing. All are welcome here. Mary is queen mother of all who enter. Here too, she is flanked by tall, graceful attendants. First on the left is Melchizedek. Abraham, about to sacrifice Isaac, must look away from Mother Mary and Moses. Nearby stands John the Baptist with the Lamb of God. The south porch is dedicated to Christ. Let us go round and enter the church there. This doorway is very grand, impressive, and masculine. It was given to the church by Pierre Mauclerc, Comte de Dreux, a, a famous member, wealthy member of the royal family. The porch is full of saints and confessors of the faith. But of the 28 great figures that make up the royal court around Christ, not one is a woman. The porch asserts the masculine orthodoxy of Pierre Mauclerc. The central scene of the porch is that of the last judgment. Here Christ is seated in judgment. Mary and John try to save souls. The whole church of Our Lady of Chartres 
is dedicated to the hope of their victory. Let us now enter. We must take a while to accustom our eyes to the light. And while our eyes adjust, let's remember why we have come to Chartres. Our purpose is not a deeply serious one. We're only tourists seeking amusement. But it so happens that our mood fits that of the church. Chartres is a toy house built to please the Queen of Heaven, to please her so much that she would be happy, charm her till she smiled. The church was built for her exactly as a little girl builds a toy dollhouse for her favorite doll. Unless you can go back to your dolls, you're out of place here. But if you can go back to them, you will see Chartres in glory. Chartres was built to be Mary's delight by people devoted to her. Now, the measure of this devotion can prove itself to any American mind beyond all doubt by the money it cost. In a single century, from 1170 to 1270, the French built 80 cathedrals and nearly 500 churches of the cathedral class at a cost of $500 million. Well, this investment in the Virgin Mary expressed an intensity of conviction never reached by any passion, save perhaps war. Now that our eyes have adjusted, let us look about. We begin at the front of the church with the great rose window over the western doors. The rose symbolizes Mary herself, Rosa Mystica. This great window dominates everything in the church and gives it its character. The window is 44 feet across. Its size alone proves its importance. It is the most conspicuous object the Virgin would see from her shrine behind the high altar. It is the most carefully considered ornament in the church. If we turn to our right as we stand at the central crossing, we see the Rose de France over the Virgin's portal. If we turn to our left, we see the rose de Drew over Pierre Mauclerc's porch. All three of these great rose windows were designed together. What inspired these windows was the desire to bring light into this house of Our Lady. We must put aside the false idea that Gothic architects loved gloomy buildings. His passions were for color and light. The windows are the crowning glory of Chartres. We must study them closely. Let us go up the nave and uh, look at the western windows. Starting with the window on the right, representing the Jesse tree. These windows claim to be the most splendid color decoration the world has ever seen, since no material, neither silk nor gold, can compare to translucent glass. And the Jesse window is said to be the most complete and perfect example of this greatest decorative art. You see now a color world whose technique was lost 500 years ago. And notice the blue. See how the artist has used blue for light. See how shades of blue run in one continuous strip from top to bottom. If the Jesse tree tre teaches us anything at all, it is that the artist thought first of controlling his light. The Jesse tree is a genealogical tree. Look through your binoculars. You see Jesse at the bottom panel, who begets David, whose descendant is Mary, the mother of the Christ. The Jesse tree was not put there to please us, but to please the Virgin. Look at the center window next to the Jesse tree.
there at the top of the window sits the Virgin next to her genealogical tree to prove her divinity. On either side of her, the sun and the moon offer praise. Her two archangels, Michael and Gabriel, offer her the scepters of spiritual and temporal power, while the child in her lap repeats her gesture, even her expression. With your binoculars, you can see close up how Mary's life is intertwined with that of her son. The Annunciation, the Nativity, the visit of the three kings, the Transfiguration, the Last Supper, the Crucifixion, the Resurrection. And what we must remember is that the artists who made these windows were not professionals, but amateurs. They worked like jewelers, unused to glass. We must remember, too, that Chart was built not only for the Virgin, but by her as well. She gave the orders to the craftsmen. No artist would have dared to put up before the eyes of Mary in majesty any object she had not commanded herself. Now, whether a miracle was necessary or whether genius alone was enough is a case in casuistry you can settle for yourself. Let's now turn around and look at the choir. Here by the altar, beneath another image of the Virgin enthroned, the clergy sat to sing the Mass. But Mary was not only above them, she was all about them. For the choir is surrounded by a series of chapels, which in Chart are her private rooms. The Virgin herself saw to the lighting of her own boudoir. Chartres was not built for the nave or even for its choir, but for its apse and the little chapels that make up the apse. Chartres was planned not for the people or the court, but for the queen, not a church, but a shrine, and the shrine is the apse. Here the Virgin's design was most felt. From here, she could see the church ceremonial performed. You may, if you really have no imagination, whatever, reject the idea that the Virgin herself made the plan of the apse. The feebleness of our imaginations is now congenital, and we shrink like sensitive plants from the touch of a vision or a spirit. But one can sometimes feel a woman's taste, and in the apse of Chartres, one feels nothing else. The nave of the church is the space occupied by the people. It was intended to hold 10,000 people easily, 15,000 when crowded. Chartres was a local shrine in an agricultural region, and not even part of the royal domain. Its cathedral was the work of a rural society, without much more to tie it together than the Virgin gave it. What surprises us is the unity of the building, from its stone to its glass. This unity was not the creation of the flat-eared peasants or the slow-witted barons who crowded the nave, nor of the clergy who sat in the choir. The unity was crafted by the Virgin herself, who looks down the length of the nave from the great window high above the altar where we never forget her presence. When, with the crushed crowd of kneeling worshipers, we lift our eyes at last after the miracle of the Mass, we see far above, high over all the agitation of prayer and the terrors of sin, only the figure of the Virgin in majesty looking down on her people. There she is crowned, throned, glorified with the infant Christ on her knees. We feel her heavenly peace and beauty. There's heaven. And Mary looks down from it into her church, where she sees us on our knees and knows each one of us by name. There she actually is, not in symbol or fancy, but in person, descending on her errands of mercy. 
saints and prophets and martyrs are all very well. And Christ is very sublime and just. But Mary knows. It was all very childlike, very foolish, very beautiful, and very true, as art at least, so that everything else ever since shades off into vulgarity. When we rise from our knees now, we have finished our pilgrimage, we have done with Chartres. For 700 years, Chartres has seen pilgrims coming and going, more or less like us, and we can safely leave the Virgin in Her Majesty looking down into her church, answering the prayers of her people. One sees her personal presence on every side, and anyone can feel it like a child. Sitting there on any Sunday afternoon while the children of the Matrich are chanting in the choir, you or any other lost soul could, if you cared to look and listen, feel a sense beyond the human, a sense divine, that would make the world once more intelligible and would bring the Virgin to life again in all the depth of feeling which she shows here in lines and vaults, chapels, colors, legends, chants. Thank you, Henry Adams, for that tour of the medieval cathedrals. It's time now for us to follow the trail marked the modern world. While the crowds were still on their knees at Chartres, a medieval man had lost much of his faith, so that when, according to the medieval morality play, every man came to die, he had to be instructed how to prepare, how to confess, how to repent, how to receive the last rites. But he did as he was instructed and went on the way laid out for him by the church to the judgment. Only a century later, the Augustinian monk Martin Luther found it impossible to follow the prescribed way, though he was a learned scholar and knew well the path laid down by the church. Luther had to build his own road, found his own church, read his own Bible, create his own sacramental theology. In his quarrel with the medieval church, Luther turned to the ancient scriptures for authoritative guidance. Others, first in Italy and then all over Europe, turned to the ancient Greeks for direction, reading again Homer and Aeschylus, Plato and Aristotle, as substitutes for biblical revelation. In the Renaissance, it was decided that the proper study of man for mankind was man. Humanities replaced divinity or theology. When the Renaissance turned to the Enlightenment, the spiritual quest became less a matter of the soul's welfare than a matter of the mind, the intellect. Revelations from God became private and suspect. Reason provided the only sound guide in a world of doubt. Doubt Descartes raised to a system. Modern people continue to admire the cathedrals, but uh, do so as tourists. Those who read the classics and the scriptures read them also more and more as tourists just passing through. Doubt about their truth characterizes the modern mind. Henry Adams himself, just lines after his highest praise of the Virgin of Chartres, wrote this. We left the Virgin in Her Majesty, looking down from a deserted heaven into an empty church on a dead faith. Just the other day, in a fine mood, thinking about the Virgin of Chartres while perusing my newspaper, I came across the story of the assassination of Monsieur de Pleve, a friend. I thought again of the assassinations of Lincoln and McKinley. Just moments before, the Virgin herself never looked so winning, so won as in this scandalous failure of her grace. To what purpose had she existed if after 1900 years the world was bloodier than when she was born? The stupendous failure of Christianity tortures history. Now everyone must invent a formula for the universe. The old formulas have failed and a new one has to be made. I seek no absolute truth, only a spool on which to wind 
the thread of history without breaking it. Well, a spool on which to wind the thread of history is a far cry from a stone cathedral. Yet it was enough for Henry Adams, the historian, to live imaginatively in the midst of a world he said was marked by multiplicity, confusion, and chaos. There are many quests for the spirit and almost no end of spiritual movements. Nearly all are fascinating, though not a few are dangerous in their tinkering with the powers of great psychological volatility. Some modern quests are simply an extension into the present time of the search for God that has gone on for ages in churches, temples, and synagogues. But what characterizes the modern quest is the struggle with doubt which arises from the presence of evil. And in the 20th century, evil on a colossal scale. St. Augustine's definition of evil as the mere absence of good seems completely inadequate in a century when evil embodies itself in conspiracy and complicity to commit genocide. With the result that well over a hundred million people have been killed in the 20th century for political reasons. In our times, evil is not an absence, it is a real presence. And no adequate quest for the spirit or religious meaning can't ignore it. One of the most dramatic stories of a modern person's confrontation with evil is told by Elie Wiesel. As a pious Jewish boy of 13, Elie and a playmate were told that if they observed the Sabbath perfectly for three weeks in a row, they'd bring the Messiah. And they set out to do just that. They failed. Instead, on one Sabbath evening, Nazi SS troops arrived in Sigit, his village in the Carpathian Mountains in Romania. The Jews were put in cattle cars and shipped to Auschwitz. In his memoir, a terrifying little book of a hundred pages entitled Night, Wiesel tells of what he saw in a passage that is perhaps the most famous passage in all of Holocaust literature. Never shall I forget that night, that first night in the camp, which has turned my life into one long night, seven times cursed, seven times sealed. Never shall I forget the little faces of the children whose bodies I saw turned into wreaths of smoke beneath a silent blue sky. Never shall I forget those flames which consumed my faith forever. Never shall I forget that nocturnal silence which deprived me for all eternity of the desire to live. Never shall I forget those moments which murdered my God and my soul and turned my dreams to dust. Never shall I forget these things, even if I am condemned to live as long as God himself. Never. In more than 30 subsequent books, Elie Wiesel struggled to come to grips with the Holocaust and what it says about the indifference of humanity and the absence of God. His novels, plays, and essays experiment with possible responses to what the Holocaust reveals. He experiments with revenge, with violence, silence, madness, and rejects each in turn. To argue with God, though, he does not reject. In a play called The Trial of God, he remembers the night in the barracks at Auschwitz when, as a boy of 14, he witnessed a rabbinic court called to put God on trial for what he had allowed to happen. He recalls the verdict was guilty. The figure in the Bible Wiesel most identifies with is Job, because Job argued with God. Even in his memoirs, Wiesel says little about his own personal quarrel with God, but defends the old Jewish custom of arguing with God. It says it can be justified if it is done in the name of victims on behalf of those who suffer injustice. In his memoirs, Wiesel tells of meeting the great Lubavitcher Rebbe Menachem Mendel Schneerson. The Rebbe had read some of my books in French and asked me to explain why I was so angry with God. 
Because I loved him so much, I replied. And now, he asked, now too. And because I love him, I am angry with him. The Rebbe disagreed. To love God is to accept that you do not understand him. I asked whether one could love God without having faith. He told me that faith had to precede the rest. Rebbe, I asked, how can you believe in God after Auschwitz? He looked at me in silence for a long moment, his hands resting on the table. Then he replied in soft, barely audible voice, how can you not believe in God after Auschwitz? Who else can you believe in? Hadn't man abdicated his privileges and duties? Didn't Auschwitz represent the defeat of humanity? Apart from God, what was there in the world darkened by Auschwitz? The Rebbe stared at me, waiting my response. I hesitated before answering. Rebbe, if what you say is meant as an answer to my question, I reject it. But if it is a question, one more question, I accept it. The human quest for the spirit is driven by questions, not answers. 5,000 years ago, Gilgamesh asked about death and sought the answer in a journey that took him to the furthest and deepest reaches of his imagination. It was a series of questions about life and nature, life and history, that produced the Iliad, the Odyssey, and the Hebrew Scriptures. Questions about sin, mercy, guilt, justice, and mother love built the cathedrals. It remains to be seen what the chief monuments of modern doubt and the agonizing questions that produce it will be. But we already know the questions. And they are as difficult and disturbing as any that have ever been asked in human history. The spiritual adventure and quest that such questions can produce are as important as any that we have a record of in human history. Thank you.